Grace Church, if you would turn to Psalm chapter 1, that's where we're going to be today. You heard it from Pastor Jordan uh, before we sang that song. I, I hope that as we sing the Psalms, that it enriches our time in the Psalms, that, you're, that as we sing throughout this fall season, you're like, oh yeah, I remember that. I remember reading that. I remember seeing that in the Psalms and that it would enrich your soul as we go. Uh, the book of Psalms is a hymn book. It's a book of poetry, 150, written by various authors over a thousand years probably. It kind of blew my mind. I was thinking, you know, we have a psalm from Moses, and on the other end, you have psalms written like close to the Babylonian captivity. And so you have this wide range of years, different authors, many by David, King David, uh, but all on the same theme, and that is worship, the worship of God. Some were set to music, and I think that's why it's appropriate to sing the psalms and to write songs based on the psalms. And we're going to spend some time in a select group of them this fall. You might have noticed on your way in that there's uh, psalm booklets. If you would like to read through the entire book of psalms with us this fall, grab one of those on your way out and begin reading starting tomorrow. That's when our, our readings start. You'll get all the way through by the end. Our small groups will also be studying the psalms uh, in some of them. I think most of them are actually doing a psalm series that will go along with this. There may be some different ones in the small group series than the ones we do on Sunday morning though. So uh, in any case, I hope you have psalm number, number one open today. Uh, if you don't know where Psalms is, it's kind of easy because it's the, kind of the middle part of your Bible and then you go backwards into Psalm chapter one and we're in book one. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yield fr its fruit in its season. And its leaf doesn't wither. In all he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Psalm chapter 1. Sometimes I like to play amateur mechanic. I'm not very good at it, but I can do some simple things. Like uh, recently I changed the battery on my wife's car. Uh, and so I bought a new battery, brought it over, uh, took the old terminals off, uh, take the old battery out, set the new one in, put the new terminals on. And of course I made a mistake. Even with a simple job like that, I dropped the wrench into the engine. Have you done that? Isn't it annoying? Like, how do, you, how do you get the wrench out of the middle of the engine? And so, like, I stick my hand in the... Do you have a way? Does someone have a way? Okay, so I, I stick my hand into the engine and I can't get low enough to grab it. And then I think, well, maybe if I put some kitchen utensils together and kind of put them down in there, I can, I can try to lift it out of there. And, and of course, you know what happens. It goes deeper into the engine. Like it gets more stuck than when it was first stuck. That kind of describes some of our lives, don't they? You know, I'm more stuck than when I started. And I tried to get unstuck and I was more stuck. Then I thought, maybe a magnet will work. But I, don't, I couldn't find a magnet, you know. And, and is that even going to work? I don't even know. I, I just, after half an hour, I said, that's its burial place in the car. It's just, you know, have a service. It's in there. Could someone help me get that out? <laughs> so it's there to this day. It's been there for about a month unless it flew out somewhere. And I, I don't know. I don't know. But, but I want to talk about getting stuck in life. Sometimes we say, man, I got a lot of problems. But, but the funny thing is, in the middle of the problems, we all have a desired outcome. You know, my outcome was I want a car that, that works, you know, and starts up like it should and all of that. We have outcomes that we want for our marriage. I want to feel closer to my spouse and be more in love with her. We have outcomes for what we hope for work. I hope I, you know, meet my whatever productivity goals that I have and, and everything goes well. We, we have this thought of what down the path is supposed to look like. Like how much better things can get. And then we read like Psalm 1 and it says, 
blessed is the man. And, and, and we're like, okay, that is the blessed life. Not your best life, your blessed life. And, and, and we want to live the blessed life. And I, I, was, I was listening to one scholar talk about this and he said, um, he said, this word blessing is like, is like the word like happy. Happy is the man. Happy is the man who lives under God's blessing, who experiences all that God wants to give that person. And, and it's also a word that kind of signifies what you would say about somebody else. Like you would look at them and say, they are blessed. It's so good to be that person. And so we all want God's blessings on our marriage, in our home, at our job, wherever you serve in church. You want to experience the blessing of God. But what does that mean? How do you get there? And and I think for some of us, it ends with good intentions. Like, I I hope I have a better marriage this year. I, I hope that Things go better at work. And, and, and we have all these good intentions, but intentions never get to the destination. Like they never actually take us there. But there is a path to blessing. There is a way of blessing. So Psalm 1 reveals the path. I, I want to tell you, uh, because it's Psalm 1, it's the first psalm. Isn't that a shocking observation? Uh, it's the, but, but it's important to know because it's the psalm that starts the psalms. It's the psalm that might help you in how you read the psalms, how you think about the psalms. It's the kickoff for the psalms. And so I think that there's things in the psalm that will help us read the psalms and understand the psalms. This has been called sometimes a wisdom psalm because it has wise words and it shows two paths that one might take. So let's take a look at this. I think uh, verse six, by the way, is the summary of the psalm. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So truly, there are only two ways in life. You can take the way of the righteous and be blessed, or you can take the way of the wicked and end up being blown away like chaff and head towards destruction. There are truly only two ways. How does that land with you? In, in the time of individualism and I want to do my own thing my own way. I want to take the third way, the fourth way, the fifth way. I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to customize it. You know, uh, this is the culture we live in. This is the water we swim in. And then God comes in and says, really, you got two paths. Pick one. But look at the destination. Keep that in mind. There is a way of the righteous and there is a way of the wicked. This is not a uh, strange and only Psalm chapter 1, the whole Bible declares this. Proverbs. There's the way of the wise and there's the way of the fool. Jesus says, don't take the broad way. That's the way of destruction. Take the narrow way that few people find and that's the way of life. So we've only got two choices here. And I'm going to talk about maybe at the end how that can be difficult for some of us to think. There's only a couple options I've got in front of me. What is the way of the righteous then? Let's talk about what this path looks like. Number one, it starts by what it's not. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. So number one is this, the righteous way is a way of no. It's it's discriminating. And I don't mean that in the bad way, like discriminating against people that are not like you. And I don't don't mean that. I, I mean discriminating as in I'm making a discriminating choice. I'm making a discerning choice. And I'm discerning who my traveling companions are down the path. Some of you say, well, that sounds like you're saying stay away from those sinners. You know, how does that work? Did Jesus do that? I'll I'll come back to Jesus. I will. But let's understand what the psalmist is telling us. We are not to walk or stand or sit with particular people. So when he says walk, stand, sit, I understand that he means Throughout your life, whether you're walking, standing, sitting, you're sitting right now, but you're sitting under the instruction of the word of God. So he's talking about all the different walks of life, wherever you go, whatever you do, 
These are the people who are not your traveling companions. It's the, the first category is the wicked. Some translations say the ungodly. Uh, A more literal translation might be the unjust. These are people who don't follow God's commands. Uh, If you want to take it more literally, this, this is a person who has broken the law and they want to counsel you in the way you should go. So this first step on the path of unrighteousness is I'm listening to the counsel of people who do not consider God. They don't esteem God. They don't love God. But they have opinions about how life is supposed to be lived and the way you're supposed to go. This is the teacher in front of the classroom that's teaching more than math and is telling you the way you should go. This is your prof. This is your friend who says, this is what you got to do. And you're listening like, yeah, that, that's what I got to do. But God is not in the equation. This is a person who's sharing a worldview minus God. And they want you to take their worldview. This is the person writing the news. This is the person blogging. This is the person making the movies. This is the person creating television shows. And when there's a message behind it that is life without God, they're giving you counsel. And in the word of scripture says, don't walk in that. Don't listen to that. Don't walk in that. That's not for you. If you took another step down the path, you would then be standing in the way of sinners. Now the word sin means to miss the mark. So this is a person who is regularly, habitually walking in sin. Sin is a lifestyle for them. They enjoy it. They're going to walk in it. And when it says don't stand in their way, that doesn't mean like don't get in their way. They're running. Don't don't stand in their way. You know, it doesn't mean that like you're you're blocking their path. That's not what it means. It, It means that you're standing with them. You're finding their way to be attractive, to be good, and you want to go in that way with them. And so you stand in their way. One of the reasons why uh, bold sinning in the church is so destructive is because we see the, the Christian who's boldly sinning and we say, well, why not me? I could go that way too. And so he says, when you associate with somebody who is boldly sinning and you stand with them, you become like them and you get further down the path. And then there's another step down the path. There's a third step down the path. Sitting. Now when you're sitting, you're getting comfortable. You're taking a break. You're sitting down. You're enjoying it. And when you sit in the seat of scoffers, you are so far down the path that not only do you hear the counsel and think it sounds good, not only do you walk in the way of a sinner and say, yeah, I think I'll I'll go that way, you actually mock the ways of God. You scoff. Sometimes I meet people like that and maybe they've had a bad experience with the church and that makes me like compassionate. If you had a bad experience with church and people treated you badly, like I have compassion for those things. But then I meet some other people who just don't like the church. They don't like the morals, the values. They don't like the God that they worship that might judge people and send them to the bad place. And and, and they just don't like that. And when you get that far down the road, you mock the ways of God. You mock the Bible. You make fun of it. And when you sit with those people, you are very, very, very stuck You are a wrench in the engine. I can't even see it right now. I mean, God sees you, but that thing is so deep. How are you ever going to get out of that? And and so I read this, and, and I understand that there's another psalm that comments on this same idea. That's Psalm 95. Listen to this. Psalm 95, 7 through 11. For he is our God, And we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, 
Don't harden your hearts as as Meribah as on the day of Massah in the wilderness when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof. Though they had seen my work for 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, there are people who go astray in their heart. They've not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So those people of Israel that, were, that had left Egypt, left save, slavery, they saw the miracles, they saw the wonders, and they were in the wilderness complaining. They were faithless. God was angry and said, you're not gonna make it to the promised land. You're gonna die here. It's gonna be your kids that make it in. And the point of Psalm 95 is today, if you hear his voice today, you dare not harden your heart. There is something incredibly dangerous about hearing from God and saying no. Of understanding that you've been walking with bad counsel and saying no. Of understanding that the way that you're walking in sin, that regular sin that you just keep on going on, and you hear God say turn and you say no. And then you end up in the place of just mocking God's ways and saying, I'm all in. I'm all in on this. And I hate these religious ways, these righteous ways. I said no. And God will hold you accountable for that. There's judgment for that. The same God that ruled over the children of Israel in the wilderness is the same God today. And so that's why the writer of Hebrews pulls that in and says, today if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. It gets so much harder to get unstuck the further down that path you go. So maybe if you're here and you're like, I'm not a believer, I'm not a church person, uh, how do you hear that? At what point in your path are you at? The counsel path? The walking in that way and just regularly sinning and enjoying, I'm just gonna break God's commands, I don't care. Or I outright reject God's ways, I hate them. I mock them. It's a pretty, if you think about it, Psalm 1 verse 1 is incredibly serious. Intensely serious. But then there's verse two, and there's a contrast. I find it interesting that he doesn't contrast with, but he hangs out with the good guys. He goes to his church every Sunday, or Sabbath day. Uh, he, he has good traveling companions. He doesn't say that, though. W watch what, it, what it's about. It's his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law, he meditates day and night. I read this and I thought to myself, this is actually about preaching too because what it means is who, who is influencing you? And, and, and it means that pastors and preachers, you're not here to hear me. You're here to hear the word. You're not here to be influenced by me. You're here to be influenced by the word. And so he doesn't say, attach yourself to a pastor. That's a great, great traveling companion. Attach yourself to a believing friend. That'll get you a long way. I mean, all those things are good. You know, have a pastor, have a friend that believes in the Lord. and You know, all, that's a different message. That's a great thing. But attach yourself to the word of God and let it counsel you. Let it guide you. The alternative of these bad traveling companions is not a good traveling companion. It's the word of God and the God behind it. The righteous way is primarily guided by God's instructions. Praise God though, of course, and I want to give a balance here. Praise God that we have wise friends that are full of the word that can also give us counsel. I have some of those. Praise God for them. But their counsel is only good so much as it's Word-based. So here's what he says. He says, uh, and, and this helps us in how, we, how are we supposed to read the Psalms? He says two things you should do. On his law, in, in his law he delights, and on his law he meditates, day and night. So when it says law, that's the word Torah. Maybe you've heard that word. Uh, it means literally instructions. It, it refers often to the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis to Deuteronomy. But in a more general sense, it means all of God's instructions, including the book of Psalms. So think about this. As you, if you're doing the Psalms reading plan, 
you're told to do two things here. Delight and meditate. If you come into this fall season and you say, I've, my heart has not been very hot for God. I come into this season kind of cold, kind of distant. Like me and God, we're not, we're not that close. Then the Psalms may delight you. They may warm up your heart and bring you into that place where your closeness with God is increased through his word. If you will determine to read the Psalms, you are saying, I want a hot heart. I don't want to be distant. I want to be near. I want to worship. I want a worshiping heart. So I read the Psalms and I delight. But then you're also saying, I want to meditate day and night. Now the word meditate is uh, one of those words that it, it sounds like what it is. It kind of like has this mur murmuring sound, not in a bad way, murmur, but, but like this reciting something out loud quietly to yourself. I've started to do this a little bit actually because it's nice to hear me saying the words and not just uh, thinking them in my head. Of course, it looks like I'm crazy, but that, that's beside the point. Uh, it, it, it means that it means that throughout your day, day and night, you have scripture that you're thinking about. I think one of the greatest joys of a Bible teacher, and if you're a Bible study leader, you, you may have the same experience. It, it, it's a great preaching thing that I get to think about scripture and I want to think about it like all the time, like all the time throughout my day. I mean, Sunday's coming and if I don't, if I haven't really grappled with the word of God deeply, I won't be ready. Ready for what? Ready for preaching. If you don't grapple with the word of God, you won't be ready either. For what? For life. You won't be ready for life. So, so uh, hear me. Uh, you ought to have an appointment with God every day. We call, some of us would call that our devotions. It could be in the morning, it could be in the evening, it could be on your break time in the afternoon. Like you need to have an appointment with God. Keep your appointments. But Psalm 1 says, meditate day and night. So whatever you've read, let it fill your mind throughout the day. Let it be the last thing you think of before you go to sleep. Let it be the thing that pops into your brain at lunchtime. Let it be throughout the day. That is just the biblical way. Um, I'm not saying your appointments are less than, actually you should keep your appointments with God. But let it fill your day. Let it be throughout your day. Practice the presence of God. So um, I think that when it says delight and meditate, these are two things that they kind of fuel each other. If you say, I'm having a hard time delighting, I don't feel close to God, then meditate. And if you're really good at the reading part, it, it'll get you to the delight. And delighting will get you to the meditating. I think they just, I think it's like a circle. Delight and meditate. Meditate and delight. Delight and meditate. And, and they just keep fueling each other in a, in a great circle of you drawing close to God. I don't know which one comes more naturally to you, to delight or to meditate, but you ought to have both. Otherwise, it, it's a really cold, st academic only study of the Word of God. So um, I see that uh, our influences are the Scriptures. They're not those wicked traveling companions. Now, I want to ask the question what happens if I do it? Because remember how we started this message. I have a destination in mind. I want to have the blessed life. I mean, right now, uh, our staff is submitting annual ministry plans to the elders, and they get to look, look at those and ask questions about what our plans are in ministry. Uh, so I've been thinking about this, like, what, what is the future that you want? Where do you think you're going? And, and the path that will get you there is this path of practicing the word of God. That's a path that will take you there. What happens when you get there well, verse three, he's like a tree planted by streams of water that yield its fruit in its season. Its leaf doesn't wither. In all he does, he prospers. The wicked aren't like that. They're not so. 
but they're like chaff that the wind drives away. So I see and I know that one of the first trees in the Bible that we hear about is in the Garden of Eden. It's called the tree of life. And, and this is the path of life. And, and, and we, metaphorically speaking, are like a tree. And, and of course, if you lived in that Middle Eastern place, that's an arid place. To be by streams of water would be pretty good, pretty powerful. And it would cause your leaves to be green. And in the right seasons, you would actually have fruit. I want to get to the season of fruitfulness. I want to make it there. Good intentions don't get me there. Walking the path of life gets me there. Abiding in Christ gets me there. Apart from him, I can do nothing. That gets me to that point of fruitfulness. But the other thing I notice about this is, this is a, this is a wonderful future of fruitfulness and prosperity and, uh, and uh, it's not like the wicked. Notice the wicked are not rooted. They're like the chaff. And so, you know, you, you beat the grain and you toss the grain into the air and the wind blows that husk away, the chaff, and then the heavier seed falls to the ground. And, and the comparison here is that the wicked are, they're not rooted, they're unstable, and when the wind blows, they just go. The wind can take them. You know, uh, tornadoes are scary, but other, other than tornadoes, I've never thought the wind was going to literally take me away. But not so with the wicked. They are in a dangerous spot. It doesn't have to be a tornado that blows them away. The righteous are rooted. And so when we talk about prosperity, we, we shouldn't think of it in terms of like, well, that means my bank account's bigger. That means I did get my raise at work and that means uh, the, these more American ideals. But what it does mean is that even in the hardest time in your life, you, you could be stable, rooted, fruitful, green leaves, even in the worst time in your life. You could say, I am prospering even as you're struggling and only a tree planted by the water of the word of God and, and, and the spirit overflowing with streams of living water, only that person can say that. This is the righteous way. So then we get to the end of the psalm and, and what we see is that there's a concluding word of judgment. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. Interesting, the standing language once again. The wicked won't stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. I'm kind of reminded of end of Revelation where we see that, we see that uh, the people that are judged are outside the city, outside the new Jerusalem. They're separated. And here the congregation is standing together, the righteous ones, and the wicked can't stand there. And then it says, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous but the way of the wicked will perish. That word knows, when it's used of husband and wife, is a euphemism for marital intimacy. When used of God and us, it would refer to how intimately he knows us, how intimately he knows the path that we're on. Jesus is the trailblazer. He knows how to walk the path. It refers to God overseeing our path and protecting us on the path, guiding us on the path. He knows the way. And so whatever's in the path, I know he'll bring me safely through. May I offer some words of application after hearing this? Uh, we say, Jesus is a friend of sinners. Should you be after reading Psalm chapter one? Should you cut them off? Walk away from them? Can't travel with you anymore? I think when you compare verse one and verse two, we're talking about what our greatest influencers are. And so let me say it like this. The healthy don't need a doctor. The sick do. Do you have sick friends? 
Are you there to share medicine? Are you on mission? Are you influencing them? Are you the light of the world? Would you shine a light in a dark place? Or are you being engulfed by the darkness? Are you being pulled into that way? And if that's the way it's going, you need better traveling companions and you need some separation there. But if you're on mission, be the friend of sinners. Share with them. Love them. Be Christ to them. That's what we're called to be. And so I think it all comes down to who's influencing who? And do you see yourself as on mission? And take heed lest you fall. That's the first thing I would say to consider from this. Uh, the second one is, um, I alluded to earlier, most of us, a lot of us probably wish there was a middle path, if we're being honest. There, there's the righteous path and there's the wicked path. Can we have like the mediocre Christian path? You know, it, it's got McDonald's on the way. <laughs> uh, there's lounging chairs. It's, it's just easier path to walk. I'll take that one. I'll take option number three for the path, please. And, and I think it's true that if we're really being honest, we'd prefer not to go all in. You know, 1 John 3, 6. Anyone that abides in him doesn't make a practice of sinning. And you read 1 John 3, 6 and you're like, well, I make a practice of sinning. You know, feels like it some days. And then I read 1 John 1. If we say we have no sin, we lie and the truth is not in us. And you go, John, you can't have it both ways. You can't tell me that if I belong to the truth and abide in him, I'm not gonna sin. And then over here, you say that if I, I claim not to have sin, I'm lying. Which one is it, John? And then I read Psalm 1 and I'm like, you tell me this is the path of the righteous. This is the path of the wicked. Sometimes I find myself stumbling over the path of the, path of the wicked. Sometimes I drift over. What's up with that? I don't want to drift. We all live with this tension, don't we? Christians don't sin. Except for you and you and you. A lot of you over there on that side. Yeah, you college. I know, I know, I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But numerically, the ones down here have sinned more. So actually, you're okay. There we go. There we go. And, and, and it's like, yeah, okay, Christians don't sin except you and you and you and me. Isn't that how life really is? So how can the psalmist say there's two paths? Pick one. Well, fortunately, we have a great Savior that forgives us of our sins. That, that, that's the first major thing to know. But the other major thing to know is that, hello, we're, we're, we are going to stumble on the path, but we're still on the path. You are going to stumble. You're going to mess up and keep walking the path. But woe to you if you look at yourself and say, I'm actually on the wrong path. I'm all the way over there. Sometimes I think, sometimes I think it's like, uh, it's like we want to drive to Wisconsin and we start going south. You will never get to Wisconsin driving south. You'll never see a good football game driving to Chicago. You got to go to Green Bay. You knew it was coming. You knew it was coming. Okay. Um, you, you, you'll never get to Wisconsin when you drive south. And I think sometimes we think like, I'm going to go down this road and walk this way, but I'm sure I'm still going to get to the right destination. Are you? Are you really? I don't know. I don't know. And so if you look and you say, I've drifted, well, that's okay because Christians drift. Get back on the path. But if you're walking in the counsel of the ungodly and standing in the way of sinners, and God forbid you eventually sit in the seat of mockers and scorners, I know where that path goes. And the Bible makes it clear. Beware that path. There's no third way. There's no mediocre way. I don't see the lukewarm way. I see the righteous and the wicked way. Take your pick.
That was a little bit of preaching, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there we go. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and finally, I would say this. It really is your choice. It really is your choice. If you've heard this today and you want to keep walking the way you go, you've chosen your path. But God says, choose life. That's Old Testament. Choose life. And it will go well with you. By the way, I'm not preaching a work salvation here or a moralistic sort of thing. Uh, if you find your wrench trapped hopelessly in the engine, you may have to turn the car over. Are you strong enough to do that? But God is. But God is. Not my analogy, given to me between the services, actually. Good analogy, eh? Uh, you can't turn over the car on your own. This is not a try harder, self effort sort of thing. This is a God inviting you in and empowering you to do what needs to be done. Sometimes I talk to people and they'll come to me for counsel and they will say, I've got lots of problems and I need your help to figure out the problems. And when we get to the end of the problems, what I really find out about the problems is it's just plain disobedience. You brought these problems. You did this. You chose a path of problems. You chose a path that did not acknowledge God or his word and you wondered how you ended up here. And the most refreshing thing in the world is to hear somebody say, we got problems and I know the root of them is spiritual. Somebody said that to me this week. We got problems and I know we can't fix them because they're spiritual. And I'm like, oh, praise God. I could start a worship service on that. <laughs> I got problems and I know they're spiritual. And I haven't listened to the word of God and I repent. You're in the best place possible for that. Can I, can I close with a word? Uh, I think it will encourage you. Uh, there is, I think, a New Testament version of Psalm chapter one. You want to see it? You sure? My balcony people? Yes? Okay, all right, all right. Uh, go to Ephesians chapter four. Go to Ephesians chapter four. Did you college students study Ephesians recently? Good. Then you know this. Why didn't you tell me when I said that? Okay. All right. All right. All right, all right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. Ephesians 4.17. The New Testament version of Psalm chapter 1. Uh, now I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Don't walk in the counsel of the wicked. You see it? Verse 18. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the, the, of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. They're not walking in the life God has because they've, they've hardened their hearts. They are the sinners on the way. They practice sin and they're hardening. Verse 19, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. They've gone so far down the road that they're completely hardened and calloused, and they've given themselves up to every kind of impurity. Verse 20. But that is not the way you learn Christ. Or is an exclamation point there? Am I supposed to say, but that's not the way you learn Christ. Assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. How do I renew the spirit of my mind? The word of God. It's the word of God that renews my mind. And, and, uh, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Psalm chapter one, Ephesians four, 17 and following. 
Same message, same word from God. We shouldn't be surprised. Same author. The Holy Spirit has given this to us. Uh, I don't know how you will take this, what you'll do with this message, but I do hope that you choose life and choose the way of it and choose your Savior. Let's pray. Father, uh, I, I thank you that you have really boiled things down for us here and, and, and you reveal the path of life to us and you show the way of the wicked and where it ends. Father, we confess that we have stumbled at times. We've fallen down, we've drifted. We've looked at the other path and thought it looked pretty good. But we repent of that. We confess it as sin. May we walk your path. May we walk in your way. May we walk as your son or daughter, as you desire us to. Father, when we feel powerless and weak, we know you are powerful. When we feel so stuck that we would never make it out of this, we know your hand comes out for us. We know that as a good shepherd, you... If we were injured, you'd throw us like a sheep over your shoulder and you'd, with your powerful shoulders, you, you would carry us back and set us on the right way. And so I, I pray for those who find themselves walking in the wrong way, that you would empower them, give them delight, desire, and may they walk in the righteous path. I pray that for them in Christ's name. Amen.